Welcome to this lecture in the OO36 series on the future opportunities for manufacturing medicines. Or another way to think about it is 3D printing and inkjet printing. So if you don't have one already, get yourself a cup of tea or coffee. I've got mine here. Sit back, relax, and let's make a start. Let's start by looking at the learning outcomes from the lecture. Or another way of looking at this is to say what you should know by the end of the class. Uh, particularly before an exam. Yeah. So the first thing is to understand what types of drugs are currently being formulated and by that I mean uh, small molecule or large molecule. So we're going to see what sort of drugs are being approved by the FDA in particular. I want you to understand some of the challenges that are being faced by the farm industry and there, there are a number but we're just going to focus on two and so that's large molecule delivery which is typically biological molecules and the need for personalised medicine. So we'll, we'll briefly discuss that in just a second. So don't worry right now if you're not quite sure what that is. Once we've looked at those, I want you to understand why we need new manufacturing paradigms in the first place. Paradigms means a way of doing something, okay? So a new, a new way of manufacturing uh, medicines. And then we're going to pick uh, two. They're both called um, additive manufacturing, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But that's inkjet printing and 3D printing. For inkjet printing, there are two types of inkjet printer, but there's only one real way of printing, so not too difficult to learn. But for 3D printing, we're going to look at a number of different types of 3D printer, and you should be able to explain how each one of those printers works, as well as give examples of how they might be used to make uh, medicines. And within that, there is one 3D printed product which is commercially available, so we're going to look at that. You should be able to explain why that product is 3D printed, what made the company choose 3D printing as a method of manufacturing, what advantages it confers to that product in particular. Okay? Right, let's consider how medicines are formulated at the moment. If we think back for the last hundred years, most molecules that you might describe to me are what I would consider to be small molecular weight organic compounds. Small meaning 500 or less, molecular weight, organic compounds meaning safe to swallow, obviously, based on uh, carbon. Two are shown on the screen in front of you. Aspirin is one and paracetamol is another, both very classic molecules. And if we were to have a lecture about how we might formulate those molecules, we would probably look at the physico-chemical properties of the molecules. Remember our Lipinski's rule of five, for instance. And we would make a decision how we might choose to formulate those molecules based on physico-chemical properties. Two of the most common would be solubility and partition coefficient. And if you know those two, you can start to categorise the drugs in accordance with the Biopharmaceutical Classification System, or BCS, as also shown on the screen in front of you. If a compound has a BCS category of 1, it means it's got high solubility and high permeability. And those are good properties for a molecule to have, and so it should be quite easy to formulate. In principle, the formulation is actually slowing the molecule down rather than trying to speed it up. If it's class 2, it's got low solubility but high permeability. And so we can do things with that in terms of the formulation to make the solubility better. We might add co-solvents co or we might um, mix it into an amorphous dispersion or something like that. But there's things we can do to improve the solubility of class 2 compounds. If a molecule is class 3, it's got high solubility but low permeability. There's very little that a formulation can do to improve permeability. Really, it's focused on solubility. So a class 3 molecule can be formulated if the um, solubility is high enough that at least some of it gets to the site of action. And I think you might imagine that with modern drugs developed with computer simulations and things like that, they can have very narrow therapeutic indices and be highly potent. And so therefore, low solubility isn't exactly a barrier to getting those drugs in solution. It just makes it a little bit harder. And if a, a drug is BCS class 4, that's got disastrous properties, really. And so there are fewer class 4 drugs on the market, simply because they are much harder to get into the body. What that means, then, is that if you're considering formulating a molecule like that, you're probably going to end up with putting it into a solid, typically a tablet or a capsule. And I think if you went to your doctor and you, um, you were prescribed something, your expectation would be that you would receive a tablet or a capsule. And that's how the pharmaceutical industry is set up. Now, 
If we look at the top 10 drugs by sales, because let's remember the pharmaceutical industry is a money driven industry, isn't it? And so it likes to rank things not on how effective a product is, but how much money it brings in. It's kind of weird, isn't it? So the top 10 drugs from 2010 are shown on the table in front of you. Uh, top drug, you've probably heard of it, Lipitor. That's a Torvastatin, I think, isn't it? It's a Pfizer product. So uh, annual sales in 2010, 12.657 thousand million. Okay, well, what's that? 12.6 billion. 12.6 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money, isn't it? No wonder Pfizer's share price was so high. And if you go down that list, you can see some other ones. Plavix, 8.8 uh, .8 billion. Serotide, 8.4 billion. Essentially, to get a drug into the world's top 10, you've got to be selling at least um, five or more billion dollars worth of that product a year, haven't you? It's kind of scary. Now, if you look down that table uh, against the product name, you can see some stars next to some of the names. So while I have a bit of my coffee, I'm going to give you just a moment to think to yourself, what does the star mean? OK, so the first interactive part of this lecture, what does the star mean next to some of those names in the table? Had a little think. You may know this, actually. The answer is those with a star next to them are monoclonal antibodies or uh, biological drugs. Uh, you might think of them, which means that seven out of the world's top 10 best selling drugs uh, in 2010 were small molecular weight organic compounds and three were biologicals. OK, now if we do the same analysis for 2020, so um, just last year, here is the table again. Humira is now the world's best selling drug. It's made by AbbVie and uh, 19.6 billion US dollars in sales. That's inflation for you, isn't it? And then you've got some more Keytruda from Merck, 11.1 billion and so on as you go down the list. Um, the list isn't here to show you how much money some of these pharma companies are making. Well, it's quite staggering, isn't it? The list is here to make you look at the stars again. So again, I'm going to take a little bit of coffee while you look and see, are there more or fewer stars in this table than there were in 2010? That's not a difficult question, is it? And the answer is there are more. <laughs> Clearly, there are more. There are, in fact, seven stars in the 2020 list compared with the 2010 list. What does that tell you? It tells you that biologicals are becoming increasingly important, doesn't it? Rather than being a few biologics in the top uh, 10 um, best selling drugs, as they were just a decade ago, now it's almost all biologics, isn't it? And there are very few small molecular weight organic compounds really making big money these days. So the, the world, at least the pharmaceutical world, is moving towards the formulation of biological molecules. So that's an issue right there, which I'm going to come back to in just a second. If we think about some of the issues that the pharma industry is facing, one is that the whole pharma industry is set up to make tablets and capsules. So I said it already, but most small molecular weight compounds are formulated in tablets and capsules. And therefore, if you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer, you've got a factory making some of this stuff, the factory itself is set up for making tablets and capsules, <laughs> and that has a, a number of issues. One issue is that when you make um, tablets, let's say, you're going to make them in a single unit dose because you've got a massive great hopper of powder and that powder is being fed into a punch and die machine. And you don't want to keep changing the formulation or the tablet and, um, and die set to make the tablets bigger or smaller to change the dose. You want to make as many tablets as possible as cheaply as possible. And the way that you do that is to make all the tablets the same. So when you look in the BNF at different tablet formulations, you'll see there are very few different um, dosages. So for a particular drug, you might have three or four different dosages, but that's it. Now, that's fine if the drug itself is, um, say, not very potent or has a wide therapeutic index. Something like ibuprofen, my favorite drug example of all time, is a very low potency drug. And so it's what's available in 200 milligram or maybe even up to 500 milligram tablets, isn't it? Because it's not very potent. And so it really doesn't matter whether someone needs 250 milligrams or 300 milligrams. It, it makes no odds and they can take more or less and still get essentially the same outcome. Think about um, blood thinners, warfarin or something like that. That's much more specific, isn't it? And you're probably going to go down to, say, half milligram doses. So I know. There's two milligram and four milligram on the market, for instance. But if someone needs three milligrams, they have to cut some tablets to make the specific dose because that's a narrow therapeutic index drug. 
And these issues are becoming much more uh, important as molecules are becoming much more um, potent. And so the control of dose is really, really important. And the more doses that patients need, the harder it is to make those with conventional tablets because you have to make them in um, mass production. So, so that's one issue. Another one is dose combinations. So especially for conditions like um, hypertension, um, you can't really get good control of blood pressure with just one antihypertensive. Typically two. If you give two antihypertensives of different classes, you get much better control of blood pressure. On the screen is an example of a clinical trial. I think it was from 2017. Uh, and it is looking at control of blood pressure with four different types of antihypertensives. And what the study reports, you can go and read it, it's in the Lancet, is if you try and give a patient one antihypertensive medication, you get really poor control of blood pressure. But if you give them four, and they're relatively low doses actually, so four low doses, you get almost 100% control of blood pressure. Now that's good if you're trying to control blood pressure, but it's bad from the patient's perspective because they've got to try and take four different tablets multiple times per day. And one of the main reasons that people don't really control their blood pressure is because they don't adhere to the medicines regimen because there are too many tablets. The problem with um, high blood pressure, as I'm sure you know, is you don't feel it. So you don't know that you've got high blood pressure. And so the majority of cost to the NHS in treating patients with high blood pressure is not the cost of antihypertensive medication. It's the cost of treating cardiovascular disease, for instance, which has developed later on because the patient hasn't been controlling their blood pressure. So if you're going to give patients multiple antihypertensives, they're not going to take it if they're trying to take multiple tablets. And so you need a way of getting all of those antihypertensives into one tablet so the patient's only taking one thing each time. Right? What else? Biologics. I said I was going to come back to biologics. Uh, biologics are tricky. They're large molecules, primarily made of, say, amino acids. Uh, and they are going to be denatured, aren't they? So if you try and swallow one, so you're going to go for oral delivery and that ends up in your stomach, first thing that's going to happen is your body is going to look at that as um, some sort of food stuff and it's going to break it down into the individual amino acids. And so that's very unhelpful in the first place. But there are some other issues as well. Um, one is that most uh, biologics have either a um, secondary, tertiary or quaternary structure probably all of those things actually. And if you try and change the pH, or you try and take that molecule out of solution to make it a solid. So remember, tablets and capsules are solids, aren't they? You've got to take the molecule out of solution to make it a solid. You can lose that sort of tertiary structure. And that's not good. And if it doesn't recover that tertiary structure when it rehydrates, you've got no activity. So that's a bit of a problem as well. So what that means is you generally formate a biologic as an IV in a solution for injection, as shown on the screen, Avastin. I think you'll see Avastin was on my table just now, wasn't it? And that's not good from the patient's perspective. And if there are seven of the world's top 10 best-selling drugs are now biologics, that means when you go to the doctor, you're starting to expect to get a solution for injection, not a tablet. And that has a number of issues, doesn't it? Patient compliance is one, but another one is you need a lot more healthcare professionals trained to give injections because a patient can swallow a tablet themselves, but they're not really going to inject themselves IV um, every day, for instance, are they? So there's a number of formulation challenges related to um, biologics. So what that means is, what have we got? We've got the need for personalization. We've got the need for changing dose control. We've got the need for um, trying to formulate biologics. Is there a way that we can think of that we might be able to change the way that medicines are manufactured in order to formulate some of these molecules more effectively? And that really is the point of this lecture. The answer, I think at least, and this is not just because that's what we do in my own laboratory upstairs, although that is a factor I've got to say, is um, additive manufacturing. And by additive manufacturing, I'm really talking about inkjet printing and 3D printing. I really believe that additive manufacturing is one way forward that we might start to change the pharmaceutical industry to address some of these needs for the future. OK, so I guess we ought to think about before we get into some specifics, what do we actually mean by the term additive manufacturing in the first place? Now, you might have heard of the term additive manufacturing and really the clue is in the name. It means adding things, manufacturing by adding things together. OK. 
Now, some people find that term a bit confusing. So what I normally say is think about how things are conventionally made right now. Let's say you want to make something out of aluminium. You're probably going to mill it, aren't you, with some sort of mill. And so you start with a block of aluminium and the mill comes down with a cutting bit on the end of it and it removes material. So conventional manufacturing is subtractive. It means you start with a large amount of material and you remove it to make the object that you're trying to fabricate, subtracting material. Think about what that means in terms of what the mill can do. It can really only make some relatively gross shapes, can't it? It certainly can't make shapes with lots of hollow and intricate structures because the drill bit or mill milling bit can't actually get in to the material to remove it. So you end up making these relatively coarse structures, which you may be able to refine later on. Additive manufacturing, on the other hand, means starting with nothing. So you start with just a build plate, nothing on it, and the printer is depositing material to build up your object. And it generally builds objects layer by layer. Now that's really important because you're not removing material, you're adding it and you're starting from a, a sheet of nothing. And you can make some really intricate shapes with additive manufacturing that you can't make with subtractive manufacturing. So right from the get-go, 3D printing and inkjet printing offer you a way of making shapes that you couldn't make before. And that always offers, uh, um, offers opportunity for the pharmaceutical industry because you can make things to dissolve more quickly or in a different way because the shape can be different. So in my own lab, we started with inkjet printing probably 15 years ago or something like that. And then we moved into 3D printing about 10 years ago. And now we have a really large uh, group that does 3D printing. And if you look at some of the papers that I publish with Professor Bassett, you'll see that there are a lot of examples of how you might use 3D printing uh, for pharmaceutical development. If you end up doing a project in um, pharmaceutics in either mine or Abdul's lab, then you can end up using some of the 3D printers, assuming that you're ever allowed back into the laboratory in this world of coronavirus anyway. So if you're interested in that, fire me an email and we'll see if we can sort something out. Now, on the screen in front of you, we're just going to look at some inkjet printers first. There are two common types of inkjet printers. They would be piezoelectric or thermal. It's kind of interesting, actually, when you buy an inkjet printer, different manufacturers use different technologies to, to fire the ink out of their printer system. So if you buy a printer by Hewlett Packard or Canon, chances are it's a thermal inkjet printer. And if you buy a printer from anyone else, so um, Epsom, um, that's the only other manufacturer I can think of, I'm sure there are some others, uh, it will be a piezoelectric system. So the piezoelectric is way more common than the thermal printer, but the thermal one is actually more useful in the laboratory, as I'll explain in just a second. Now, because I've spent many years looking at inkjet printing, I feel the need to explain to you how they work, just out of idle curiosity, if nothing else. So on the screen in front of you is a diagram of an inkjet printer which is operating thermally, okay? Thermal inkjet printer. It's very simple. So imagine that you've got the print cartridge, you're holding that print cartridge. I don't know if you've ever looked at one, but if you look at it really closely, you'll see it's like a metal grid with some fine holes in it. Each one of those holes is a nozzle, which is ejecting ink droplets. And so when the printer is building up your um, image, usually, because in this case, an inkjet printer for, for um, documents and pictures, uh, it is simply firing different colored droplets out of each one of those nozzles to create the image that, um, that matches what's on your computer screen. OK, so the way it does that is you have a reservoir of ink in the cartridge above the nozzles. And when you send the command to the print head to print something, what it actually does is send a current through a hot plate. And it's not a very big hot plate. It's more like a, a resistor element. So the um, red square on the screen with the W in the middle of it, the W is meant to be a heating wire, a bit like the middle of your toaster in the morning. When you pass a current through a wire, because there's a resistance, the wire heats up. So in this instance, the printer passes a current through that wire and it heats that plate up bit like your toaster working in the morning. The, the wire glows red, doesn't it? It's the same principle. So an inkjet printer, the temperature can rise from around about 40 degrees centigrade to just around 300 degrees centigrade really fast in a matter of milliseconds. OK, so very rapid rise in temperature. What that does is it causes dissolved gas in the solution to expand. 
So the ink for most um, thermal inkjet printers is water-based. And water can contain quite a bit of um, dissolved air. And so what happens is there's a rapid rise in temperature of that heating plate and dissolved gas in that solution starts to form bubbles and those bubbles start to expand because gases expand as they get hotter, don't they? So what happens is the heating element rises in temperature, the gas starts to expand and you create this bubble. The bubble starts to push some of the liquid away. The liquid has to move and it can't move towards the reservoir above it because the weight of ink in that reservoir is way, way too high for a small air bubble to try and move. And so the only place that the liquid can move is down and out of the nozzle. And so as it does that, the bubble expands, the liquid moves out of the nozzle and is ejected as a droplet. OK, one bubble creates one droplet, essentially, by pushing the liquid out of the nozzle. Then what happens is you've got this rather large um, bubble in your um, nozzle, but the temperature in the nozzle is a lot cooler because it's not near the hot plate. And so the gas starts to contract. As it contracts, it creates a partial vacuum and that is refilled from the liquid reservoir, re uh, reservoir speak properly, above. OK, so this is called drop on demand printing. It's drop on demand because one pulse of electricity through that heating element creates one droplet and it creates one droplet because one bubble will have been created to push that droplet out of the nozzle. It's also the reason why if you buy a Canon printer in particular, they're called bubble jets. And the reason is because they are literally using bubbles to drive the formation of the droplets in the first place. OK. I like this type of printing system because it's very robust. And as I said already, the ink solutions for this type of printer are water based. So when we started using inkjet printing in the lab, we actually used a Hewlett Packard system that we cut the top off the ink cartridges and replaced the inks with water based drug solutions because it's really good for, for driving um, aqueous based inks. One of the reasons for that is because water has a really high surface tension. Surface tension means it will hold itself over a hole because the surface of the liquid has quite strong bonds. And so you need quite a force to drive a droplet of water from the nozzle. And heating this way to 300 degrees centigrade really drives um, that liquid forward. And so it's much better for um, aqueous based systems. This is a diagram of a piezo electric system. It looks very similar, doesn't it? to the um, thermal inkjet system that we just looked at. And that's because essentially it is very similar. The difference is it doesn't use a heating element to drive the solution out of the nozzle. It uses two piezo crystals. So you may or may not be familiar, but if you take a quartz crystal and you pass a current through a quartz crystal, it vibrates. Normally with um, watches that are battery powered, not, not wind up watches, but battery powered watches, they have a a quartz crystal in there to keep time because it will vibrate with a natural frequency. So the way this works is where the nozzle is that the liquid's coming out, either side of that nozzle are two quartz crystals. When you want to create a droplet, you put a current through the crystals and the crystals vibrate. If they vibrate, as they vibrate out, they will effectively squash the capillary, which reduces the volume inside that capillary and the liquid has to go somewhere. It can't go up because of the weight of liquid above it and so it goes down and the droplet is ejected and then as the crystal returns to its original position so it's cycling like this as it returns to its original position it creates a partial vacuum and that has to be refilled from somewhere and it's refilled from the reservoir above and so the process repeats every time the crystal vibrates once a droplet is produced from the nozzle and so it's another drop on demand printing system uh, this type of system is really good for organic solvents because you can make the capillary out of glass or metal, thin glass or metal, obviously, because you want it to vibrate. And those are very resistant to organic solvents. If you make this out of plastic, organic solvents tend to dissolve them. But if you make them out of glass or metal, that's really good for organic solvents. And also, because a piezo crystal isn't vibrating very much, the driving force that a piezo crystal can generate is a lot less. And so it tends to work better for um, solvents with low surface tension. So ethanol, methanol and all those organic solvents have low surface tensions. So much better way of printing this. We have both of these systems in our lab, actually. So, so we can print either aqueous or organic systems, depending on which printer system we choose to use. How, I hear you ask, does an inkjet printer actually help you make a medicine? And that's a good question, isn't it? I think if you've ever sat in front of an inkjet printer watching it print your holiday photos, 
you will recognize that to use such a system to print a tablet, it's going to take a long time, isn't it? Because it's going to have to build up a really lot of layers of ink in order to, to create a tablet. So I don't think that an inkjet printing system is going to be used to create a tablet, sad to say. But I do think, however, there are some instances where an inkjet printer is useful. So one would be for tablets with really, really low doses of drugs. Think of contraceptives, for instance, or contraceptives. What's the dose of that? Say 0.05 of a milligram, so 50 micrograms. That's, that's a very small amount of drug powder. And if you're trying to make a batch of tablets and you've got, say, 100 kilos of drug powder, the amount of drug that's in that is very small. And making sure it's uniformly distributed is a huge engineering challenge. Think about making uh, blank tablets, so no drug in at all. Content uniformity is an issue that goes away, really, doesn't it? So you've got blank cores with no drug. You could pass those under an inkjet printer and you could print the drug directly onto the surface of the tablet. That's perfect for really, really low dose drugs. Think about if you wanted to make a batch of, say, 50 microgram tablets and then another batch of 40 microgram tablets. You could instantly switch what the printer is depositing. Even within one batch, you could have one row of tablets at 50, the next row of tablets at 40. It's a really good manufacturing system for changing the dose and you can print any dose the number of doses that you could print with that system is effectively infinite there is another um, set of um, products that i think inkjet printing also applies to and that is oral film strips so those are those thin polymer films that you put on your tongue and they dissolve relatively fast uh, in this country at least there aren't so many there used to be more in the us but um, we have a couple so gasex which is semeticone and nicotine, which is nicotine, obviously. They're both oral film strips containing relatively low amounts of um, amounts of drug, and it's the same deal. Imagine that rather than having paper passing through the inkjet printer, you had a polymer film, then the printer is working exactly like it's printing a photograph, except rather than printing a picture, it's just printing, say, a square of drug. And so um, I think that it lends itself very well to manufacturing uh, these types of formulations. Before we stop, for a cup of tea, uh, one thing to think about is what happens if we want to print a biologic salmon? You've already said that biologics are kind of not very good for oral delivery because of the, the potential for hydrolysis in the stomach, and I would agree with you. You can also use the inkjet printer. Imagine that you've got um, a colour inkjet printer. It generally has three reservoirs of ink uh, with different coloured inks in, and you can mix those inks together to create whatever shade of um, colour you're looking for. From the perspective of manufacturing, you can put different things into different inkjet cartridges and print different things. So you might imagine that you start the blank core, as shown on the screen. You might print um, under an inkjet printer a drug layer. And let's say that drug layer contains a drug which is acid labile. You then might go underneath the second printer and you could print an enteric coat on top of that drug. So there's all sorts of ways that you can think about using this technology to create you know, really quite complex final products but the manufacturing step is really easy it would just be a core made by a conventional tablet um, press and then it would pass under two inkjet printers one depositing drug and one depositing enteric coat so manufacturing is kind of simple right what we're going to do is we're going to stop for a cup of tea and when we come back we're going to talk about 3d printing so with that i'll see you in a bit 